How long is too long before an accused person is tried in a court of law? Last summer, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled on that question, and its decision has jolted the criminal justice system. It's called the Jordan decision, and it's led to people charged with crimes all the way up to murder walking away. Joining us now to take us through that decision and its consequences, Kate Matthews, President, Ontario Crown Attorneys Association, and Megan Savard, partner, Adario Law Group, LLP, and counsel for the Criminal Lawyers Association in a case where the Jordan decision was recently revisited by the Supreme Court of Canada. Great to have you two here at TVO tonight for this most interesting development in our legal situation. Megan, to you first. Before the Jordan decision came down, how clear was the test in Canadian jurisprudence for an unreasonable delay of trial? Very unclear, I would say. It it was unclear to the point that the risk of a stay of proceedings, a case being thrown out for unreasonable delay, was, I would say, more theoretical than real for most defendants. So now that the Jordan decision is in place, it is clearer? It is. It's much clearer at the outset that there's a wall that you bump up against and then you're in trouble. And that's a lot better for uh, incentivizing crowns and defense lawyers uh, to work together cooperatively. Where is that wall? 18 months if you're in the lower courts. Hmm. 30 months if you're in the higher courts. Uh, okay, here we go. In its ruling, the Supreme Court said that our criminal justice system has, quote, a culture of complacency and delay. What do you think of that characterization? Uh, I would say that if there has been complacency, it has been at the feet of successive governments who have been warned repeatedly by our association, I'm sure by the Criminal Lawyers Association, that there was a crisis coming. Everybody saw it coming. Nobody reacted. There has been no influx in resources to address the problem that was coming. And in fact, there has been a withdrawal of resources leading up to the Jordan case. So let me make sure I understand this. You're representing the, the Crown attorneys. That's right. The prosecution, if you like. Yes. You represent the defense. And both sides have been saying to the government for months and months and months, we got a train coming at us right now. Do something. Is that right? I would say years. Yes, years. Years. <laughs> And the government's reaction, in your view, has been what? Silence. Silence? Silence. Do you agree? I do. The one thing I would add is I, I do think that there is a complacent attitude, or there was until Jordan, in individual cases as well. I have to say it's understandable that resources wouldn't get devoted to this problem. It's never a popular thing to say these poor criminal accused, their rights are in danger, let's give them some money. And unless you have a real risk that meritorious cases are going to get thrown out. Neither the public nor the government is going to care about it. And under the old flexible rules, it was easy enough for a crown in an individual case to stave off the unwelcome stay of proceedings. And it led to crowns in individual cases sometimes deciding to take that gamble. So what's your view as to the incentive for the crown to try somebody quickly? Now there's an incentive. But how about before? Uh, before there wasn't one. There wasn't one. You agree with that? No. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, there is nothing to be gained by delaying a case for the Crown. And in fact, what typically happens is in the uh, intervening year years uh, between a charge being laid or an offence happening and a trial, witnesses are lost, memories shift, um, and it's just not as crisp and clear and as good evidence as you would have had earlier on in the proceedings. There's no benefit to the Crown to delay. Okay, so why do you think, I mean, clearly you two disagree on this. She says there's no benefit to delay. You think there is, or was? I, I would say less that there was a benefit to the Crown in, in delaying the case, but simply that there was no consequence if a case happened to become delayed. And delay happens not just at the res because of the trial Crown, mm -hmm delaying the actual trial itself. Delay happens at the outset if the police are not proactive about putting together disclosure, if the case management crown, who may not be the same as the crown at trial, fails to follow up with the police. Delay can happen all down the line hmm. through this multi-stage process. And at each one of those stages, there's that underlying knowledge that if I don't take the extra step, if I don't think creatively about how to be efficient, it probably won't matter. This guy's probably going to trial anyway. Let me understand better as well the impact on your clients. I understand you just gave a checklist of why it's not in the interest of the Crown to delay things. I, I presume many of your clients, um, you know, not only want these things disposed of quickly because they just want to get their lives back if they're innocent, but 
if they're in jail waiting to go to trial, that's also not a good thing. What's the impact on, on your clients? It's pretty profound, actually. I represent a lot of, of first-time defendants who don't know the criminal justice system, and I now have this little spiel that I give at an initial client meeting where I have to explain to them that the anxiety and that amped up feeling they have is something they've got to manage not for a few weeks or a few months but for potentially years and you can see their faces fall when I explain that to them. Uh, the analogy I use is uh, that going to trial in the Ontario justice system is a little bit like waiting in line at the DMV. You're, Department of Motor Vehicles. Yeah, exactly. It's it's bewildering in the number of steps you have to take. There are always forms to fill out that you don't understand. And you wonder at the end of the day why it is taking so long. Uh, and it, I have to say, there's this prevailing view that defendants sometimes try to manipulate the system to delay their own trials, knowing this remedy might be available to them. And it's not my reality. I, in any situation of uncertainty, you hear people say, I just want it over with one way or the other. And it's no different for a criminal defendant. Kate, let's understand why these cases before this decision came down, the Jordan decision, why you think they were taking so long to be resolved. What's on the list? Uh, I think you have to really look at the core issue that's causing the delay problem. Which is? Which is the nature of investigations, police investigations, uh, have changed dramatically, the nature of evidence they collect changed dramatically over, I would say, the past 10 to 15 years. From what to what? So um, an example would be a, a simple assault case that I would have had when I started prosecuting. Might have had two sets of officers' notes with a witness statement signed in it. Mm -hmm. That was your brief. Now we have in-car cameras. We have a witness with a cell phone uh, video. We have cell phone records, text messages, Facebook messages. Way more technology. There's an awful lot of evidence that is now technologically based. And you've got to go placed. through it all. You have to go through it all. Even, even a witness statement now, more and more of them are done on video. You hmm. can read something much faster than you can watch a two-hour video. All of that takes time to process for the police to get it to the Crown, for the Crown to process it, review it, get it to the defense. It creates more opportunity for dispute uh, between defense and Crown about what's relevant, which can lead to more uh, pretrial motions, and then longer trials, because it takes longer to get that evidence in. Okay. We're going to uh, Actually, I should get you to comment on that right now. Do you agree that that's one of the reasons why things have been so delayed in the past? Yes, absolutely. And what would you add to the list? Uh, I, I would also add just the nature of uh, criminal litigation now in the post-charter era. There mm -hmm. are... There are better ways to protect trial fairness, which is a good thing, but that often adds to the amount of pretrial litigation. And it's never really been streamlined and focused uh, in, a, uh, in a way that would uh, bring us back to the, to the, st the quick trials that we had pre-1982. I wouldn't want to do away with the charter, but it's definitely created more litigation. Gotcha. I think to uh, sort of the extra step beyond that, the discussion about the nature of the evidence is that as all of that has increased, there has been no response from governments in terms of resourcing the system to make sure that it can accommodate that change. Um, and in fact, as I said earlier, I think in fact there's been a reduction in those resources. Well, hang I, was, on. I should say, you say a reduction? prior to Jordan. Uh, uh, okay, because you know he's not here, but yes. if the Attorney General Yasser Nakvi were here. Uh, he says he's going to appoint 13 new judges, the Ontario Court of Justice, and 32 right. new crowns. Now, presumably, that's going to do something, isn't it? It is, and and that's why I sort of I dialed back to pre-July, or because yeah. there was then a response, and there has been a response from all levels of government. Um, certainly, that will that will help. And part of that project is we have embedded crowns now in police divisions, just two as a pilot. Mm -hmm. But that may yield some interesting uh, results about how to deal with charges at the earliest stage. Um, but it, it isn't enough. When you compare what Quebec did in their response, the Quebec government announced they were going to hire 69 extra crowns and 122 or so support staff to support the work of the crowns. There's been no influx of resources for support for crowns. Mm. So they have a lower population base than in Ontario a far better uh, response in terms of uh, a resource input. I guess we shouldn't let the feds off the hook either. I know I'm reading pieces all the time that the federal justice minister has, what, almost a dozen 
judge vacancies right now that haven't been filled, and that presumably slows things down as well. You want to go there? Yes, absolutely. I, I do also want to pick up on one thing, too, which is it's not just the increase in resources. So if the federal government appoints 13 new judges, that's fine. But it's about resource allocation as well. Kate just talked about all the ways that technology can slow a case down. We are really bad as uh, an industry at using technology for good. There are unnecessary paper-based physical court appearances that don't need to happen. If we could get rid of, for example, the daily administrative check-ins that happen in person in every courthouse across Ontario. What is that? Describe what that is. It's called a set date. I'm, I'm not that far removed from it because I'm still relatively new to, in my career, but junior lawyers will go and drive from Toronto to Brampton or to Newmarket for a five-minute court appearance where they stand before a justice of the peace, there's an assigned crown attorney calling the list, two or three hundred line items, anywhere from 50 to 100 defendants in any given day, many of whom have to take the day off work to be there, just to stand up, tell the justice what's going on and what they mm -hmm. want to have happen next. So there's, ditch that and you could just... Absolutely. There's no reason that can't be a video appearance. There's no reason there can't be a website where you log in and, and check in and have that entire conversation Got offline. It. it frees up automatically with no injection of resources, a courtroom, a fully staffed courtroom in every courthouse mm -hmm. across the province. Skype's a beautiful thing, eh? Absolutely. You've got to think about it. Let's talk about this Jordan decision a bit because this is the thing that has sort of kick-started this, um, this new panic within the justice system, if I can put it that way. Okay, Jordan is a guy, Barrett Jordan, British Columbia, arrested on drug charges. Can you just start by telling us why his case suddenly became as significant as it clearly has become? Uh, well, it's, it's interesting because um, it went to the Supreme Court uh, as, as a regular, uh, we would call an 11B application, 11B being the right to have a trial within a reasonable time. Um, and I, I wasn't there, but I understand that in the course of the exchange between uh, the uh, judges and the lawyers arguing it, uh, this idea of the fixed terms kind of came out uh, seemingly of nowhere. Um, and so it was, I think, uh, a surprise uh, when it did, in fact, come down that what, what do you think yeah, the, the court just at some point said okay enough's enough this is the we're planting our flag here yes that's I think, what happened I think that's exactly what happened so they've decided now uh, Megan that that 18 months as you told us for a provincial court 30 months in a superior court are the new I guess pretty official deadlines now you either get it done within that or else we're, we're staying the charges and away they go in your view are those reasonable timelines to hit I think the Supreme Court said it best when they said they're it's fine for now. Uh, no one likes the idea of it taking two and a half years to go to trial, mm -hmm. and it's still a compromise. These are firm ceilings, but they're much higher than the softer guidelines that we had before, in part because you need to take into account the uncertainty and the need for adjustment and the complexity of litigation nowadays. Uh, the court was very clear that it saw this as one step down the road to a culture of perfect efficiency. So 18 and 30 are not our goals. That's not what we're trying to achieve. They're the outside limits we should be trying to do better. In terms of why those numbers, I, I couldn't tell you. It was uh, the Criminal Lawyers Association has been pushing for ceilings for a while, but we hadn't put forward a particular number in the Jordan case. It came up, as Kate said, in oral argument, and then the court just picked their own numbers. Gotcha. Let's consider what the fallout of this is, because I presume now I mean, the last thing Crown attorneys want are people charged with murder walking away before, you know, uh, without their charges being dealt with in a court of law uh, and the concomitant political consequences that come with that. So do I assume that you are reallocating resources to deal with the most serious cases first? Yes? Yes. And if that's the case, does that mean some of the lesser cases are now in trouble? Yes to both. Hmm. So the immediate response uh, to the Jordan decision in Ontario uh, was that there was an immediate review in every Crown's office across the province uh, of every active, well, every case that was in the system to assess where it was in the process, um, how serious it was, uh, which were the ones we were going to prioritize. And we have to do that because we, we cannot have 
murder charges dismissed in this way or stayed in this way. Right. So murder obviously gets priority, but what, murder, what else is important for you? Um, well, that's an interesting question because uh, in depending who you are in this process, they're all important. But clearly murder, child abuse, uh, major gang uh, investigations, prosec prosecutions, um, sexual, sexual violence cases, um, domestic violence cases, uh, in pairs. These are all cases that are, uh, I believe, important to the public. In which case, what gets back Bernard now? Well, that's a good question because uh, in that's order... That's what we do here. <laughs> that's what we do here, Kate. We ask the questions. That's good questions. Okay. But what happens is, in that process of trying to prioritize, every... We were trying to... If, if it looked like a case was already set too far down the road and we'd be outside the guidelines, we were actively trying to find some available court space sooner. And so to do that, you're bumping others out of the way. Mm. And so those cases are then at risk. Let me ask Megan about that. Do you have clients whose cases are now being dealt with in a much longer timeline because they're not as urgent as, as a, you know, a murder or a child abuse case, something like that? I've mostly noticed the opposite. Uh, my more serious cases are suddenly uh, the subject of a lot more scrutiny by the prosecuting crown. Uh, they're much more motivated to free up their own dates, to think creatively about whether they can reassign the case to someone more available. Mm -hmm. So to the extent I thought I might have an 11B in my manslaughter case, it's becoming much less likely because the crowns are, there's a new energy to the, the prosecution in those more serious cases. I would say, though, that's not necessarily a positive thing, <laughs> uh, odd as that may sound, because what we're forced to do, as Megan pointed out, is sometimes we're forced to reassign cases so that we can make sure we can get them on because we can't be triple booked. Right. Um, but it is not ideal, especially on a major case like a homicide, to have one crown do all of the work in the pretrial work and the prep and know all of that case and then have to pass it off to somebody else who's going to have to do all of that work again. And, and there's a risk when that happens, and we've seen that happen, where things get dropped and things get lost in that transition phase. Might be good for her clients, though, to have a <laughs> crown come in there who's not quite as up to speed on the material as the original crown. It might be. It might be, but it's not, not how we would like to proceed. You want to go there? Honestly, I prefer to deal with one crown all the mm -hmm. way through. Um, and I, I think it's because when you don't, there used to be a system in Ontario, at least in Toronto, where you'd have different crowns assigned at different stages. Mm -hmm. Every single time a new crown comes on, you have to re-explain your case, re-establish mm -hmm. the legitimacy of some of your points. So it doesn't work for you and, either? No, especially not when my client is paying for me to educate a new crown every three mm -hmm. months. Gotcha. Okay, Kate, talk to us about this. Uh, have you seen situations so far, given these new tighter timelines, where people charged with extremely serious crimes have simply been allowed to walk out of the courtroom because uh, the judge in his or her wisdom believes that you have not met a speedy deliberation of justice? We know that there are um, certainly four homicide murder cases that have been stayed pursuant to Jordan. In what uh, province? Um, one in Ontario, one in Alberta, and I believe two in Quebec. Uh, we've had uh, serious child abuse case stayed in Ontario involving uh, a two-week-old whose ankles were broken. We have had um, a sexual assault of a three-year-old uh, stayed due to Jordan. Um, those, are, those are the cases that I think would grab the most attention. But as I said, impaired driving, there are a lot of impaired driving charges tend to get caught on 11Bs. Um, and the, wide, the whole wide range of the criminal code is going to be subject to this. And let's just understand what this means. Stayed, does that mean, it doesn't mean innocent, or it doesn't mean not guilty, but does it mean you walk out, we're done, we're, we, and we can't come back at you? It's done. And I think it's the worst of all worlds for, for everybody because uh, the, the complainant, the victim, does not have the opportunity to have their day in court. The public doesn't get the opportunity to hear all of the evidence on uh, issues of serious public interest. An accused person doesn't get their chance either to have their day in court. And there may be a defense there that they don't get to present. And so I think probably the public perception is they were guilty and got off. Well, but, okay, I don't want to speak for you, but do I infer that you're just as happy to have the 
the charges stayed and have the guy walk out? It really depends on the case. Uh, legally speaking, uh, it's, it's what you the want. same. Yeah. He walks free. There are no conditions. But in the one Ontario case that Kate just mentioned where a defendant in a murder case was released, the judge made a point of saying in her decision, this is a bit of a hollow victory for the defendant as well. He goes through life now with the label of suspected murderer. And he doesn't get a chance to hear a jury come back in and say not guilty, which was a very real possible result. The Supreme Court, I think, also said that if you crowns could prove exceptional circumstances, quote unquote, you can pass that 18 month or 30 month deadline. So what does that mean, exceptional circumstances? I think it remains to be seen what that means uh, because as happens pretty much with every decision of the Supreme Court, it then filters down and every trial level decision is going to try and apply the analysis from the Supreme Court to the facts of their case. So I think we're going to have to wait and see how the courts interpret that. You would think uh, that that might mean one of those big prosecutions where you have multiple accused or you have a, a huge amount of uh, technological kind of evidence, digital mm -hmm. evidence, wiretapping, all of those things that can make a trial particularly complicated. But I don't think we know yet. Megan, how often have you gone to court, said to the judge, Your Honor, this is a classic case of Jordan. Uh, they've taken too long. Uh, I'm not even going to introduce a defense. Let them go. So it's, I wish it were that easy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, I'm watching too much TV, I guess. Eh? Honestly, I it have to say... speed things up. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> yeah. true. I, in some cases, the cases that are over the ceiling, it's a really easy thing to do now. You can say, look, it's over the ceiling. It's on the crown now to explain why. But what has become less common, and, and these are a lot of my cases, are trials that have taken, in my view, too long. So a simple assault case in the Ontario Court of Justice, one day trial, should be dealt with in a matter of months. All the disclosure should have been available on the first court appearance. It's now taken maybe 15, 16 months due to unacceptable conduct, let's say, on mm -hmm. the part of the institution or the Crown under the ceiling and so now the test on me is actually much more onerous and my advice to my client has changed. I no longer tell that client who's been waiting 16 months to bring an 11B application because it's not nearly as certain that it would succeed. Hmm. Okay. Uh, trial by jury. If we had fewer trials by jury, would things go faster? Yes. So should we do that? Uh, not necessarily. Um, we do it's as... It's never simple. It's never that, simple. It? <laughs> um, the Crown regularly uh, agrees uh, to a defense request to go judge alone. Um, but the, the big exception would be on homicides. Uh, from the Crown perspective, those cases that are the most serious of the criminal code, mm -hmm. there is a real public interest, of course, in those cases. Um, the principle of a, of a trial by jury, by a jury of your peers, uh, is a really important one and and from our perspective those most serious of cases like a homicide should still be heard by a jury except in very rare circumstances. What's your view on that Megan? I disagree with that. Okay. It's the defendant's right to a trial by jury and he's the one charged with murder. If he wants a judge alone, particularly if he has a narrow legal defense, he should be entitled to that and it could free up weeks of court time. So we should not bring in new rules or conventions saying if this is the case, then you're allowed to have a trial by jury. If not, forget it. No. I would say if you're going to change, change the rule, change the rule that requires them to have a jury trial in a homicide case. How about preliminary hearings? Uh, we've seen, uh, again, the Attorney General, Yasser Nakfi, suggest that maybe there are some times when you don't need to have a prelim and therefore go straight to trial. That'll save some time. Is he right about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, you just disagreed with the Attorney yeah, General of I, Ontario I, on television. I did. He'll probably watch. He might watch. You never know. <laughs> I think that that is a band-aid solution. And it's, it's premised on this idea that I'm not sure is right, that if you go for a preliminary hearing and then a trial in Superior Court, you get 30 months. But if you don't go for a preliminary hearing and then a trial in Superior Court, you still get 30 months. So to me, the idea of abandoning the preliminary hearing is just a way of taking advantage of the high ceiling without all of the procedural steps that justified the ceiling in the first place. And what's the value of the prelim to begin with? It, a couple of things. So it's no longer as useful as a tool for figuring out the Crown's case. It used to be we didn't know the Crown's case until we went to a prelim. Now we do. 
Nowadays, it's much more useful for filtering out the cases that never should go to trial in the first place. It's the first chance for an independent third party to look at the case and say, yes, that's good enough to go to trial, or no, it isn't. In Ontario, right now, it's the police, and now with a little bit more Crown involvement, who make the decision about whether to lay the charge. The defendant should be entitled at the earliest opportunity to have a judge weigh in on whether they made the right choice. What's your view on that, Kate? Uh, I think if you asked 100 Crowns uh, their view on the value of a preliminary hearing, you would get maybe 50 different answers. Um, we, uh, there are times when I think they should certainly be more um, circumscribed. So we, could, we can narrow the issues, we can make them more efficient. Um, I have done preliminary hearings where I've benefited as well from the Crown, from hearing from the witnesses and getting a chance to test the case as well. So. Um, Meaning once you've heard what you've heard, maybe you've dropped the charges or something like that? Yes, or, or we think maybe there's a good resolution here that we may not have thought of or was appropriate in, in the earlier stages. Um, but I think the bigger point about prelims uh, in this whole discussion is that governments, sh we need to be looking for ways to make the system more efficient, and there are ways to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and we've talked about some of them already, electronic appearances, video appearances, electronic information. But I think there is a risk in um, trying to uh, minimize or uh, lessen uh, substantive uh, rights that are part of the process. We, don't, we want to always be making a decision on how to prosecute a case uh, on a principled basis. And I don't think we should be looking too far into cutting out these substantive uh, procedural streams in order to try and save money, basically, or to avoid putting more money in. Understood. Uh, thanks to both of you for coming in and helping us understand the consequences of the so-called Jordan case. And we should probably have the two of you back in a year and see yes. what the consequences happens. continue to be as they go along. Kate Matthews, President, Ontario Crown Attorneys Association. Megan Savard, Counsel for the Criminal Lawyers Association, also a partner at Adario Law Group, LLP. Thanks to you both. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.